welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Renew Group and which we called the Need to Renew Schengen. We are three days away from uh, 14th of June, which is the date when we celebrate the signature of the Schengen Treaty in 1985. So this year we will be 35 years away from the moment when five member states decided that this was a good thing to do for their citizens. And during these 35 years, Schengen has become, and this is one of the key storylines that we hear all the time throughout Europe, uh, has become the most cherished achievement of this union. It brings our citizens together, it opens borders, it allows um, people, um, businesses, merchandise to move freely across Europe. And yet, behind the storylines, there are challenges, there are realities that worry us all, citizens, politicians and scholars. So today we are going to discuss during two panels, both the current challenges that Schengen faces, the fact that we still have European citizens who are not part of Schengen, the fact that over the last five years we've been having internal border controls justified by other reasons than necessarily those that we find in the Schengen Agreement, or at least some of us think that way. Or lately, with the COVID-19 crisis, it has kept us all in our, um, within our borders. Um, few, before we start with the panels, a few logistical remarks uh, for us all to keep uh, a good uh, discipline and to be able to follow properly uh, today's discussions. So first of all, in terms of the language regime, we have both English and French. So those that want to listen to either of the two have this possibility, as well as the speakers. So please go to the menu uh, and choose the language that you would wish to follow, and then you will follow that language throughout the uh, discussions. Second, very importantly, I would very kindly and we ask all those that are connected to mute their microphones until unless they, uh, it's either their turn to speak or they would like to somewhat intervene. Otherwise, it would affect the quality of our conversations. So, um, welcome again. We have two panels. I would now pass the floor to my colleague, Abir, who will be moderating the first panel. Abir, over to you. Thank you, Dragush, and uh, good morning to everyone and welcome to this uh, Renew Group uh, webinar uh, about uh, a highly uh, timely and relevant uh, uh, issue uh, where, we where we will be discussing the current uh, state and the future state of the Schengen area. As, as we might all know, uh, the Schengen area and the freedom of movement is one of the biggest, actually, uh, wins for our citizens that directly affects our citizens, the businesses uh, and uh, the services uh, within the EU. And it is one of the greatest victories that we have been able to achieve. Yet, no, all, not all citizens within the European Union are included, but a great deal of them are included. And as Dragos very well pointed out, we are celebrating several anniversaries, uh, uh, anniversaries of these. Uh, among them is the 35, uh, 35th anniversary of the uh, signature of, of the Schengen Agreement and 30, the 30th anniversary of its implementation. And I know that in many parts we take it for granted, uh, our freedom to move. Uh, but it has been challenged. This freedom has been challenged and this victory for our uh, citizens have, have been challenged. And it's not only the, fast, uh, the past few months. I mean, for a while ago, some years ago, uh, some of the countries, member states chose to introduce border controls. But in mid-March, there was a quick uh, a reintroduction of the uh, of the borders, internal border controls, and uh, both the Commission and the member states have been uh, been promising to uh, begin to uh, take away those border controls. Uh, where you know that uh, when reintroducing border controls, many of our citizens, millions of them, their lives, their businesses, their families. 
and in general the freedom of movement have been affected. And uh, we are now in June and we hope uh, to perhaps have let some of the worst parts of the health crisis behind us. And uh, we are looking forward uh, to the borders to be opening again. And as we approach this development, however, it is all more important to actually uh, attempt to learn something from this situation that we have. And uh, we are experiencing uh, still now for the last few months. Uh, how do we move forward from this uh, situation? and uh, in uh, in way that uh, that makes sure that we need that we meet the future crises maybe better equipped and in better unity as a unit and uh, in order to do this i me myself and i believe that dragos as well and the whole group of the renew europe group of the european parliament believe it is of utmost important to take a moment to view what has happened and what we can learn uh, from it. We have two great panels here with us today to discuss uh, the present and the future of the Schengen and to hopefully have the virtual room uh, and leave it slightly more educated on the next steps that need to be taken for a stronger freedom of movement uh, in the future. Each panel will be followed by a, a question and answer session. Those of you watching are very welcome to send us their questions through uh, the chat function uh, of, uh, of if you are uh, uh, on, the, on the webinar. And if you're watching Zoom, indicate that you would like to take the floor. But first, however, uh, I would like to give the floor to, um, to our panelists and uh, let us start the discussions and Plunge, us, uh, plunge ourselves into the discussion. And I have a very uh, uh, um, competent uh, uh, panel, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussions and, and to hear from you on the news. With us today, our guests are Natasha Berto, the Deputy Head of Cabinet, uh, Vice President Margrethe Schinas, uh, Mr. Frederick Young, Diplomatic Advisor to the Minister of Internal Affairs of France, uh, Ambassador Drahuslav Stefanik, Special Representative of the Migrants and Refugees at the Council of Europe, Jean-Claude de Borrier, Director of the European Affairs Programme Egmont Institute, and our very esteemed colleague, Sophie uh, Intvelt. She is also a member of the Parliament from the uh, from Netherlands, from the part D66. A warm welcome to you all and thank you for taking the time and being with us here today. First of all, I'll give each and every one of you seven, seven minutes to give an introduction as to what is the current state of the Schengen and what have been the consequences so far for citizens and migrants. Will the member states open up as promised? And have the member states and the EU institutions handled the crisis? Have we learned anything from the earlier strained situations? So with this, I will first turn to Mrs. Natasha Bedro, uh, the Deputy Head of the Cabinet of Vice President Magrita Schinas. Please, the floor is yours, Natasha. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in today's event, because, um, which I believe, as you say, is a very timely and, and welcome moment to be discussing uh, Schengen. The Schengen area is the, the largest uh, free travel area in the world and it allows more than 400 million EU citizens as well as visitors to move freely and goods and services to flow unhindered. And as such, it's you know, one of the major achievements of European uh, integration. And I think um, amongst uh, our staff, that's perfectly undisputed. But the reality is that it has been put under strain. Uh, by pressures at the external border, by gaps and loopholes, uh, as well as by diverging national asylum reception and return systems. Of course, I mean, the absence of internal border controls is what is what makes Schengen what it is. But concerns about existing shortcomings have contributed to the, the triggering of internal, um, a temporary internal border controls. And the longer that these controls continue, the more questions are raised about their temporary nature, uh, as well as their proportionality. For the Commission, it is very clear that temporary controls may only be used in exceptional circumstances to provide uh, a response to situations that are seriously affecting public policy or internal security. 
and as a last resort measure, they should only last as long as the extraordinary circumstances persist. We also believe that checks uh, at borders um, in relation particularly to the, the migration situation are not the only and often not the best way to ensure a sufficient level of control. We believe that police checks distinguished from border checks can be a highly effective alternative and still deliver uh, the results that member states need. What's more, uh, new technology and improvements brought, brought mostly by the interoperability proposals that we have on the table are also being developed which should allow for these uh, kinds of controls to be less intrusive. And so the Commission is fully um, committed to safeguarding and preserving Schengen and the free movement of people that it ensures. That is why already before the pandemic, we've been working with member states to encourage the full listing of controls and provided a series of recommendations for how they could uh, use police checks to replace those, uh, those border controls. The pandemic, of course, has had an unprecedented uh, impact. And since the beginning of March, 17 Schengen states uh, reintroduced border controls in relation uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and of course, restricting free movement and reintroducing the border controls in this way has harmed the single market and the smooth operation of supply chains. More than this, they harm our European way of life in a union where citizens can travel freely across borders, whether as workers, students, family members, or even tourists. And that is why the Commission immediately took action and we issued guidance to Member States on establishing green lanes to avoid uh, food shortages, the vital functioning of the internal market and ensure exception for, for essential workers and transport workers were made. And I know this is not uh, perhaps the prevailing narrative, uh, uh, but I would I'd like to underline that cooperation among Member States on, on these border measures has actually been extremely intense during this period. We've hosted ministerial meetings every week and technical meetings as often as twice a week, where all Schengen states attended and all systematically informed both us and each other of the measures before they took them. And the cooperation was actually so intense that you know many member states were complaining to us that the meetings were too frequent. Um, <laughs> and, and then on the 13th of May, the Commission presented a phased and coordinated approach to assist member states in returning to full free, free, full free movement as soon as possible, based on clear and objective uh, criteria. And one of the things that we're doing so that we emphasize is that there can be no discrimination in the lifting of these controls. Any restrictions that remain can only be based on public health considerations and not on nationality. And moreover, when travel rest restrictions are lifted between two member states or between two regions and different member states, the same treatment should be extended to all member states and all regions uh, in Europe where the health situation is comparable. This to us is a really important point because non-discrimination between EU nationals is black and white in the treaty and under no circumstances did we want to see this principle um, undermined. And we're now happy to be able to confirm that by 15th of June, uh, practically all Schengen uh, states will have lifted internal control and we're calling on the remaining uh, few to, to also do so by the 15th of June. But even as we start to put this crisis behind us, we still face a situation that a number of member states uh, maintain, maintain their controls linked to security or migration concerns. And uh, I realize I'm running out of time, so I will just list quickly the things that I think uh, will be necessary to restore uh, confidence in the area of free movement. The first is that we need a reformed migration, asylum and return system that effectively tackles unauthorized movements, something that we hope to achieve when we present the, the, the new pact on migration and asylum uh, shortly. The second is we need a new set of, uh, well, the new set of border management systems that are, will start to come on stream as of next year, um, including the entry exit system, the European travel information and authorization system, and the expanded visa information system. All of these together will form an integrated IT border, border management platform that makes sure that we check all third country nationals, whether visa free or visa holders, arriving in a legal manner on the EU territory. The third is making more efficient and systematic use of the Schengen evaluation mechanism to verify how member states implement the Schengen key and being quicker, uh, I mean, and by we, I mean the Commission, being quicker uh, to launch infringements when member states persistently fail to do so. And lastly, we need to, wait to find a new way forward on the proposal to reform the Schengen border code that's been on the table for several years. And so also in the upcoming Pact on Migration and Asylum, the Commission will propose new measures to further reinforce alternative border controls. And in particular, we would like to set up a Schengen forum to stimulate cooperation and more trust and feed into the discussions on how we can have a fresh way forward on Schengen. So I'll stop here and I look very much uh, forward to hearing the other panelists 
and to, to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha, and you're really a good example. Stayed within your time limits exactly seven minutes. Thank you for that, and let's hope that we keep up the, the, this good example. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Frédéric Young, Diplomatic Advisor of the Minister of Internal Affairs in France. Uh, thank, uh, the floor is yours, please. Merci infiniment pour uh, cette invitation. Merci à Fabienne. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabienne, as well. So it is a sheer pleasure to be here with you today. I hope you can hear the English interpreter. I hope this is the case, given that I will be speaking French, says the speaker. And I agree with what Natasha said. Over the past six years, we had three major challenges. The first one was the migratory crisis. The second one was the security issues we had in our fight against terrorism and the third challenge we faced was the sanitary crisis these are challenges because those events led the member states to react the way they could with the means they had the goal being to uh, make things work in 2015 we had no common migration measures and this led to uh, poor actions we had a unique migratory crisis host countries were uh, welcoming a lot of uh, migrants and the other member states decided to turn a blind eye on this we had a lack of uh, of support and some borders were closed without a reform of the asylum and migration program and we hope we'll have a common program in the future we won't have a functional, efficient border system. Because if we open borders on the inside of the Schengen area, we need to look at our external borders. So we are looking forward for this uh, migration pack. Then, as I said, the second challenge was the fight against terrorism. Several member states, including France, implemented border controls in order to fight against terrorism within the eu in this large area we created we understood that we didn't have enough means to fight against terrorism and security uh, threats all the legal efforts that have been uh, done with the european parliament in order to ensure better control of our borders, everything we did in order to uh, check uh, people that uh, were suspicious or the Schengen controls, all those uh, tools that have been implemented recently and that are not enforced yet for some should allow us to get new tools to replace border checks and border controls so in a way i would say that we need technical and security tools that allow us to open the european area while securing our external borders the third challenge that I mentioned was the sanitary crisis, sanitary crisis that we faced for a few months now. Some people said that there was a lack of coordination between the member states with those border controls and those uh, bo border uh, closures uh, across Europe. 
We had a lack of coordination because it was a unique sanitary crisis. We had thousands of uh, deaths across Europe. And the quickest measure to face that challenge was for some member states to limit uh, the movement of people in order to limit the pandemic. Internal borders have been closed, and this was unique. Those measures were just echoing the confinement measures that had been implemented at the national level. Given that people couldn't move at the national level, that was the case in France, for instance, it made sense to extend that with a, a border control. However, France did not do it too quickly. In a way, France reacted to measures that had been taken by other member states. And this led to this, that feeling of a lack of coordination. However, as Natasha said, there was a need of coordination in order to set common rules, in order to uh, work in, a, uh, in an organized and joint manner. We organized uh, video conferences uh, with the European Commission in order to coordinate, and we had bilateral uh, contacts between member states in order to avoid this. For instance, we worked a lot in order to support the, the people living in one member state and living in the other. The end of confinement and the opening up of our borders is made in a joint manner together. We are working together to put an end progressively to confinement. We took coordinated and simultaneous measures. And France proposed, for instance, to uh, make sure that everything was uh, just like before from the 1st of July. Just a few words about a risk of another wave of uh, coronavirus. Is there a risk to have more border controls and border closures? Well, I'm not sure. Our sanitary systems have adapted. We have tracing systems, we have barrier measures that have been implemented and integrated by our citizens. And in case of a second wave of COVID-19 pandemic, I don't think that the first measures will be border uh, closures, but rather to try to handle things at a micro level, not even at a national level. Let's not forget all the disruption that this led politically, economically. Such restrictions had large impacts. In case of second wave, we now have new tools. We are now experimented. We have learned. And to conclude, I would say the following. Whether for sanitary or migration issues, we have to improve. Our asylum program must be improved for the Schengen area to be operational. We are improving our measures, our PACs, to make sure that the Schengen area is performant and our sanitary experience and coordination that we have implemented together taught us that Yes, there are challenges. There are things we hadn't understood before. Europe as a union of member states, union uh, and uh, Europe as a union as a well, whole, can face those sanitary challenges in a more efficient way with a coordinated approach. Our goal is to have freedom of movement, 
obviously. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Frederick Jung. And let's hope, let's keep our fingers crossed that uh, next time we don't uh, even be more protectionistic and uh, stop the import of medical important uh, goods. Ambassador Drahoslav Stefanik, the special representative of migration, migrants and refugees at the European Council. Please, the floor is yours, Your Excellency. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much and I would like to thank you for, for the invitation to join this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I'm a special representative uh, of the Secretary General of the Council of Europe on migration and refugees. I would like to make maybe two personal comments at the, at the beginning. I, I come from Slovakia, the country which joined the, the EU on to the, in 2004 and then later joined the Schengen area. And if, you, if all polls and, and, and all, all, all enquêtes, they show that the, 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 the big, biggest achievements of the joining or, or, or benefits of the joining of the EU was, was the, the free movement of, of, of persons, in particular sensitive for for countries and persons who were living behind Iron Curtain. So Schengen is one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest achievement uh, seen uh, by, the, by, the, by the people in countries from the, from the former, former communist uh, part of, the, of, of Europe. Second thing is that, of course, I, I'm, I'm working for the Council of Europe and I live in Strasbourg. And uh, last time I was in Germany, you know, was I think in February, so which is also very sad, I, I can't visit uh, friends, uh, or to go to Schwarzwald, or to do to some, do do some shopping, which uh, which I which I used to uh, in, in in Germany. That can be confirmed by by Madame Madame Keller, of course. Uh, so so we are waiting for the 15 of June. Hopefully that the 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 borders will be will be again uh, free, and there will be there will be no 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 no, no checkpoints. Uh, what I would like to bring to this discussion is the is the human rights ang angle. Uh, this was a bit, I would say, forgotten at the beginning when the crisis uh, started. Uh, the, the countries, they turned to, to themselves to, to, to protect the, their uh, own population, citizens, which is, of course, from the political point of view, uh, very, very logical and, and, and very natural re reaction. But, but only then, I think, we were, we were turning also to, uh, to, the, to the protection of human rights issues or, or, and, and fundamental freedoms. Yesterday, I was, I was, I witnessed uh, again. Unfortunately, only through video, there was a signature uh, between the Frontex European Border and Coast uh, Pro Agency and the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU on the on the uh, providing the training for for uh, future standing corp. So, so with the, with with Schengen, with the with the with the remo re uh, renewal of Schengen and uh, removal of the of now internal uh, checkpoints. Uh, the very important issue is the protection of external border and uh, according to the new regulation of, on, of Frontex by 2027 the Frontex will have 10,000 standing corp. Those standing corp will be of course important of protecting external Schengen border, external EU border but also they will have to uh, abide and they will have to follow human rights so, so we will have to train them and this will be huge Undertake, undertake, and, and I'm happy that the, the two, that yesterday the, the Frontex uh, and, and FRA, from, which is based in Vienna, uh, signed an agreement on, on that. Uh, of course, we, we recognize there is a uh, duty to control European borders. We have different uh, I would, uh, legal instrument in, in place. Of course, for the EU, it is Charter on Fundamental Rights for the Council of Europe, but also all EU member states, because the Council of Europe comprises all, all EU member states. It is the European Convention on Human Rights, which contains articles which have to be, have to be respected and followed. And they can, uh, some articles like articles two, right to life, or article three, prohibition of, of ill treatment, torture, uh, cannot, cannot be derogated, uh, cannot be derogated even during the, the, the crisis, during the crisis of pandemic, so, so there are some rights which have to be are absolute, and this I would like to also underline uh, that even during the pandemia uh, era, or, or uh, we, some rights uh, have to have to be observed, and according, uh, within those rights, actually, is the is the pro, is the principle of non refoulement which is centerpiece of the of the asylum, 
and a centerpiece uh, principle of the of the protection of asylum and 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 and, and uh, uh, persons who are seeking the international protection. So uh, then we have also, of course, EU Schengen Borders Code, which comprises many many rules, but which which also uh, contains many human rights and fundamental freedoms safeguards. So, for instance, on the on the control of European borders. We have Article 3 that border of the Schengen Border Court, that, which says that border control measures must be without prejudice uh, to the rights of refugees and other people requesting international protection. So we have to really not forget about, the, uh, about these people. They can be turned back and turned down, uh, in, or asylum procedures can be suspended, as, as there are some, some, some attempts uh, by, by, by some, some, some EU member states. Uh, we have also, of course, in the place many directives, qualification directive 2011, uh, 95 EU return directive, uh, asylum direct directive, and of course, uh, I would like to mention that we are much waiting and, and impatiently waiting for the for the new EU pact on migration, which uh, will be out. I don't know when. Uh, we heard that June. Then now I'm, I'm I'm listening to some some information that it will be Ju July or even even later, later than in July. Uh, so uh, I would like to underline these, 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 these aspects. Maybe they will be not, 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 uh, not uh, picked up by, 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 by other speakers. Again, the principle of non refoulma which is the cornerstone of international refugee and human rights law. Uh, if you turn back the person who can be Prosecuted in a, in, a, in, a, in a country of origin, that that, that will be contrary to the to, to the human rights uh, or human human rights instruments, including co co contrary to the EU fundamental uh, rights charter. Uh, we were speaking about special measures in the case of uh, pan pandemic. Uh, under the Schengen border co borders code, uh, such measures. So I'm, I'm now quoting really the, the, the internal EU, EU regulation. Such measures must not be discriminatory and must be proportionate. In addition, they may not, pre they may not prevent people from seeking protection from persecution and, and or ill treatment. This is Article 37, Articles 3b and 7 of the, of the Schengen Border Code. Uh, under Article 18 of the EU Charter, Member states have to give access to asylum procedures for people who seek international protection. That I, as I already said, this is this is the right which is not derogable even the, in, the, in the in the in the during the crisis or even during the crisis of of a pandemic. I would like to also uh, I would fi finish maybe we have then we have time for question and answers. Uh, I would like to also underline the the importance of the two courts which we have. One one is in Strasbourg, European Court of Human Rights. And the other one, of course, is Court of Court of the EU in in Luxembourg. They are quite often actually uh, judgments, or they are quite often dealing or addressing the the cases, uh, addressing the the migration or, or refugees issues. And uh, it was very very recent case in Luxembourg before the Court of the of the Justice of the of the EU, where where. Court was dealing with the with the so-called transit zones between between Hungary Hungary and, and and Serbia and that judgment actually contributed to to very very positive uh, move from the government of Hungary which after the judgment was rendered closed those those uh, transit centers because the, the court in Luxembourg uh, judged that uh, ruled that these so those centers were very very close or, or were kind of detention centers which was not not in line with the with the eu uh, acquis so uh, this is my message don't don't forget the, about the about the about the human rights of course schengen uh, internal internally can function only when we have uh, strong protection of external borders but but the human rights shall be observed in in any time I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And I can uh, uh, reassure you that we, from the Renew Group at least, uh, the human rights, the respect for the human rights is a, is a flagship that we always follow. And here among the, uh, the listeners from uh, my colleagues from MEPs are many of them always question 
and always ask about the human rights perspectives when it comes to both internal and external border controls. And thank you for, for your remarks, and we will take them, of course, with, with us, and hopefully we'll have a debate later on. Next on, on the speaker's uh, panel, uh, Mr. Uh, Jean-Louis de Bourouet. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Um, my Swedish is, <laughs> I, I blame it on Sweden, <laughs> as many other things. And he is the special represent, uh, no, he's the director of the European Affairs Program and, at Egmont Institute. Thank you very much for being with us, and the floor is yours, and I know that you will be speaking in French. Thank you. And you have to unmute yourself. Ah, voilà, now, parfait, merci. Now we hear you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank merci beaucoup much. de m'avoir invité. Thank you very euh, much for inviting me. Madame la Présidente, je vais me situer dans une perspective historique, si vous le permettez. If puisque... you allow me, I will put some uh, historical background, because you and Dragos, in your introduction, explained that we have uh, many celebrations for Schengen. Of course, at first, we had the 25th anniversary of uh, the implementation of the Schengen Agreement. On the 26th of March, we will have the 35th anniversary of the signing on, in 1985 and the 30th anniversary of the convention implementing the Schengen Agreement. If we use the 85 and the 90 um, 1990 period, it has been a time lapse where uh, Schengen was put into place and it has been done so quite anonymously. We don't have a lot of information about that. During this time lapse, the creation and the implementation of Schengen was a process that was quite complicated on a political and technical level. Schengen is a quality leap in the design of a nation state. We have five states beyond the community framework pull together the control of their external borders. That means pulling together, putting together what is a fundamental preserve of a state. The na very nature of Schengen is still here today, and I think that we should always think about that when we uh, have a look at the situation uh, that is happening. The three steps uh, remember, reminded by Mr. Jung, uh, fight against terrorism, the control of migratory flow, and the sanitary uh, crisis we are facing now. No, Schengen is a relationship between the states, and we can see that by the fact that still today, even after the integration of Schengen within the European Union, the access to Schengen, accession to Schengen requires a different process to the accession to the European Union. That is uh, the current situation. Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia are in the EU but not in Schengen. That's the situation. We have a situation that is an intergovernmental and that is still so within the framework of the European Union today. Let me remind you something key. We don't have a territory for the European Union. We have territories of member states that together create the European Union. We don't have external borders of the European Union. We have borders of European member states that are within the Schengen area, but that still are national borders. And I think that those trends that we are seeing in Schengen will have to be uh, kept in mind in our assessment of the current situation and in the way in which we will be able to get out of the crisis in order to put together a new governance called forward by the European Parliament in the resolution that it will approve in June. It is also one of uh, the political goal of Renew, in my opinion. There is another discussion, the relationship between Dublin and Schengen. 
Dublin is a convention that was signed within the first version of Schengen, originating the Dublin regulation that has been raised by Mr. Jung, and it is quite um, important today. Can we differentiate the future of Schengen from the future of Dublin? It is a very important question, and we will have to discuss about that in the uh, following month within the European Union and uh, the different institutions. Ms. Keller, that is reporter, if I'm not mistaken, on the future of the Dublin regulation, will have an opinion on that. Other important topic for the Schengen acquis, and we don't talk a lot about that, surprisingly, is the common policy on visas. The common policy on visas also comes from the Schengen acquis. And again, the words that are used are deceiving. We don't have European visas. We have national visas that have a transnational scope just because they are given out based on common criteria. No territory, no visas, no common border for the European Union. We should always keep that in mind. So, of course, we are facing a unique crisis, an unprecedented crisis in, in the history of mankind. We don't remember, remind us of such a crisis. The first reaction comes from states. I think that saying to the European Union that it missed the emergency phase is the wrong judgment. The European Union was not tooled in order to face the first phase in terms of health in terms of um, um, people's protection. It's, it was only normal. Then the state had to react. What did the states? Well, they used the usual tools they have, including reintroducing border controls. Well, we could talk endlessly wondering whether the border controls are an efficient tool to fight against endemic. I think that the decisions were political ones at first, and it is only understandable. It would have been quite counterintuitive to say to national population, please stay at home, but at the same time keeping open the external borders of the countries. Well, let's admit that. There is a problem, though. In terms of free movement of people, and also in terms of the implementation of the Schengen Codes, uh, these are two legal, different legal texts. In the first case, this is a free movement of citizens. In the second case, this is a common policy for migration and asylum. And different um, legal lines have been crossed, and Ms. Berthe knows that. The Commission has uh, been attacked by many lawyers, academics, or even parliamentary groups for what has been construed as a lack of firmness in its reaction. Um, it was a lack of reaction in, with regards to the gaps in Schengen or in the directive on the free movement of people. But also, again, given the uh, strength of the crisis, the fact that every political decision maker has been um, in doubt, we had to um, react quickly and we had to protect the health of our people, but also the economic interest, the free movement of goods and the internal market. As you mentioned, we are in a second step now. The question is, what is going to happen? And how can we make sure that we are building a resilient European Union? There was a sentence in a statement of the heads of states and governments saying that we should think about a better structure for crisis management in the European Union. Maybe we should focus on them at some moment. But of course, there is the discussion about the future of Schengen that is at the core of those thoughts. Many people say that we have to come back to the normal working of Schengen. But we might say that there is no normal functioning of uh, Schengen. There is always a tension between member states, uh, which positions was strengthened by the pandemics, 
and that are um, following closely the preserves and European institutions that have to apply a legal framework that is a legal framework of the European Union. We have a directive on the free movement of people that maybe can be improved, but still it is existing. How are we going to uh, make do with that balance, a very unstable one at that, uh, that was uh, proven by the very difficult situation we are in? Or will we be able to go further than that, to go beyond that? In order to go beyond that, we will have to accept a new change again, accepting that we might have a centralized authority deciding in exceptional circumstances for everyone the um, instauration of external borders, accepting, for example, in a centralized way of the um, uh, reintroduction of uh, control at every borders or at a part of the borders of the European Union and of member states, meaning that we have to shift the decision level from the member states to a centralized level at the European Union. This is the discussion that we ha will have to have in the following weeks and months. And um, on top of what has been said, on the massive use of new technologies that can individualize risks in the control of border crossing. Maybe on top of that, we will have to discuss about that uh, power level. Where will we decide if we don't want to be in the same chaotic situation where we have been facing? And we might still be facing in the next weeks or months, even though we might be optimistic about the future of free movement. Um, are we going to keep that same um, uh, area as uh, it is uh, the case today, or will we move towards something new in terms of governments? And I hope that I was not too long, and thank you once again for inviting me in that very interesting panel. Thank you. No, thank you very much for your very interesting perspectives coming from a scholar rather than uh, someone who is uh, uh, in, the, in the politics uh, that way. Uh, very interesting to to hear about your also uh, outlooks to the future. Um, now I would like to give the floor to uh, one of my most esteemed colleagues, uh, Sophie uh, Intvelt, who's been uh, also, um, he's, she's not as green as me, she's not as new as me in the European Parliament. She was here also during the, uh, what they have now become to call the migration crisis. Uh, it was a human uh, human crisis, I think. But uh, please, Sophia, the floor is yours. And maybe you can also give us a little bit of, of the uh, uh, insights about how the discussions were at that moment where when also internal border controls were introduced, maybe for the first time uh, during the Schengen history. And uh, if you can compare maybe how the narratives are changing or are there the same mechanisms or, uh, yeah, or... Uh, any other perspectives that you would like to shed some light on? Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, allowing me to speak uh, on this panel. And I think maybe first a, a, a quick philosophical reflection, um, because what are we actually talking about? Uh, we are not talking about, you know, the, the, the Schengen, the border codes and the, the regulations. Uh, we're actually talking about a... Uh, um, an, an area, a space of trust between people. Um, because I think there's always been a human tendency of, uh, you know, building walls and, uh, and, and protecting ourselves against outside threats or perceived outside threats. But border controls in there, you know, the way we know them today are a fairly uh, recent invention uh, in the world linked to a nation state. And I, I therefore think that the fact that we Europeans have managed to agree on a, a big area without borders is the biggest symbol of trust amongst people that you can, that you can have. Um, and that is, I think, essential to preserve. Yes, we also need to preserve the internal market and you know, tourists have to be able to travel freely and business people and students and what have you. But this, this fact that we trust each other enough 
to to live in this area without borders i think is uh that that's the key to to everything uh, it is you know people always say it's one of the major achievements and the, the fact that it is all about trust you can see uh, in in many places, I mean, some examples were given, Strasbourg, other places, but I think the prime example is Northern Ireland. I think there we see more than anywhere else that it's not just about, you know, uh, goods and products traveling across the border. It is about people. It is about trusting each other. It is about feeling safe. And I think speaking of safety, we also have to conclude that although we have this reflex of creating borders and walls, that ultimately the world has always become safer when borders and walls were eliminated. We have been safer in the last decades than, uh, you know, in many centuries before. Um, you were right that uh, 2015 was in a sense um, a kind of uh, turning point um, because I think, uh, you know, for many years, but certainly since 2015, but also prior to 2015, member states have been reintroducing temporary border controls. And in some cases that may have been justified, but there have also been cases that were clearly not justified, that were you know, frivolous. Um, and that is a decision of the member states. And of course it's for the European Commission to, uh, to then enforce the rules of Schengen. And there I think we, we, have, a, we have a problem. Now, um, you know, members have, in a fairly uh, chaotic manner, they have decided unilaterally to to close the borders, to reintroduce border controls, um, and 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 uh, literally erect obstacles on the road. I mean, um, something that we have not seen for a long time in uh, in Europe. Um, and of course, they they now say, yeah, it's all because of the Corona crisis. But in a way, that's you know. Uh, that's a bit of a pretext because you're right in pointing out that in 2015, the borders were also closed. At the time, it was because of this massive migration flow. But of course, the problem was not the migration flow. The problem was that the member states were unable to agree on a joint uh, approach to asylum and migration. There has never been a migration crisis. It was always a political crisis. And this, and I'll come back to this, this is the core of the, the issues with the, with the, the, the Schengen uh, area um, because member states are unable to agree on a joint approach to many things uh, migration uh, but now in this case also uh, fighting the uh, the crisis if there had been a European approach then closing the borders would not have been necessary of course everybody had to to stay uh, to stay at home anyway uh, never mind leaving the country but uh, of course there were many people who still had to cross um, the borders and that became very very difficult um, now I think it is very worrying to see how member state governments are putting the achievement of Schengen at risk uh, and how that is actually not questioned sufficiently I'm also worried to see how the European Commission seems to be completely powerless when it comes to actually enforcing the Schengen rules, because for many years the Commission has accepted that the member states have closed the borders or reintroduced border controls without a proper uh, justification uh, and, and, and without, uh, you know, f basically living up to their treaty obligations. And this poses the question of the independence of the European Commission vis-a-vis -vis the member state governments. I mean, we see in many areas that enforcing the rules is becoming increasingly difficult and that the Commission is too shy. But I think we also, as a European Parliament, have to take a critical look at ourselves. We've always had the Schengen Scrutiny Group, which of course is in a sense handicapped because it cannot, uh, you know, there is a tension between uh, scrutinizing, but then being bound by confidentiality rules uh, at the same time. Uh, we have seen the, 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 the scandals about the, the Brits um, abusing their access to the Schengen information system and the, the Commission not doing anything about it. Um, I, I do hope that in this new European Parliament elected last year, the Schengen Scrutiny Group will show some real teeth and also um, you know, somehow come to terms with this issue of uh, confidentiality. Now, I think, you know, the, the right and the freedom of European citizens to move freely in 
the Schengen area. That is a right that belongs to us, to the citizens. And I think we should claim it much more vocally and not allow member state governments to, to frivolously limit that right, limit that freedom, or uh, you know, even take it away uh, altogether. Because we see that very easily, you know, old nationalisms are, uh, are on the rise again, and people being able to meet each other is the, the, the best medicine against nationalism. Uh, and I think we all have a duty to protect that. And I, I would really, uh, you know, make a very uh, urgent appeal to national governments to take more responsibility for the Schengen area, for the European Union as a whole, uh, and not just for national politics. And finally, um, when we're talking about trust and when we're talking about doing things together, that means that we finally also have to admit the countries which have been in the waiting room for Schengen for far too long, which have been kept out, including by uh, the successive governments of my country, I have to be very honest, for reasons that had very little to do with um, you know, those countries meeting the requirements uh, of the, the Schengen area, but a lot to do with domestic politics. And I think, again, uh, I really think we have to say that national governments, by, by playing that game, are putting the Schengen area at risk, at risk. And Schengen is a vital component of the European Union, which is still the most prosperous, the safest, and the the, 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 the freest area on earth. And we have a duty to preserve that. And um, that's what I would like to say uh, as a concluding remark. Thank you very much for giving me that opportunity. Thank you very much, Sophie. It's uh, uh, always a pleasure listening to you. I would like to encourage uh, my colleagues, members of the parliament, if they would like to ask some questions to indicate in the chat, to raise the hand or write the, the question in the chat. Meanwhile, we've got two uh, questions from uh, our listeners or the ones who are attending the webinar. Uh, one is from Christian, uh, who is uh, asking why, I, I will just read it as it is written, so yeah. Uh, why has the commission not taking actions against the clearly unlawful border controls by Germany, France, Austria, Denmark before COVID? Uh, reference ter ter terror threats, etc. They were introduced years ago and have since been regularly renewed, which is clearly not the spirit of the temporary reintroduction. And that question was posted to to you, Natasha. And uh, prepare yourself to answer. I'll I'll take the second question, and um, it is from Sabine asking, do you expect the situation between the Schengen zone and the United States to improve soon? Uh, could the citizens of the Schengen zone be allowed to travel back to the U.S. during the summer? Could the American tourists come back before the end of the season? Or is the American situation still too complicated from a sanitary and political point of view? Thank you. And uh, just also a friendly reminder, uh, uh, we have until 10 past 11, so uh, Natasha, the floor is, is yours to begin with, and uh, we'll see who wants to, to take the, uh, uh, the second question. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's obviously a very legitimate question. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that you know, under the Schengen Border Code, member states do have the prerogative to introduce internal controls. That, and they, for foreseen circumstances or unforeseen circumstances, there's two legal grounds for them to do so. Uh, and the requirement is that there's a threat to public policy or internal security. Um, and there, the commission, the role that we have is that we are supposed to look at the, assess the uh, proportionality and the necessity of the controls, but we do not have the, the power to green light them as such. So we don't say yes or no, they're okay. I mean, the only means that we really have at our disposal are infringement procedures. And I think we all know how long they take and, and whether that's really the, and this is the consideration that we've had in the past years, whether that's really the most legitimate way forward. Because member states, you know, they, they in, in a lot of cases, it's also um, wide public support for, for having these uh, controls, you know, and they are uh, justified by, in many cases, very legitimate concerns. So we would find it difficult 
to you know pursue lengthy infringement proceedings and we've instead taken the the option of uh, of trying to work with the member states to provide alternatives and that's what i was talking about the recommendation that we had on um, how to replace uh, internal border controls with you know, more efficient means such as increased uh, border checks in uh, police checks in in border regions and this is the the what the, the road that we have been pursuing up until now but uh, uh, as i mentioned in my introductory statement we are conscious of the fact that you know without full implementation of the the schengen acquis by member states we uh, you know the 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 um, Schengen does risk being undermined and so we we are taking the commitment to uh, be quicker at launching infringement proceedings when the Schengen Aki is systematically undermined. Uh, thank you Natasha. Uh, I, I have a question of my own uh, when it comes to uh, the coordination between the member states when we introduced the uh, internal border controls and I think that the mistakes Mr. Frederick Jung, uh, you you approach the, uh, the the issue, but not in uh, uh, not uh, so detailed. But please, could you develop uh, what kind of coordination uh, did your specific country did, and uh, how how did it look that coordination? Uh, what what kind of coordination and steps and measures did uh, your country uh, take uh, to to be in line with others who we introduced uh, internal border controls? Merci beaucoup et je propose de répondre du coup aussi à la question qui a été posée. Thank you very much and uh, maybe I could answer as well the question on the relationship between the EU and the US. On the coordination of uh, France with its uh, European partners, I have mentioned that uh, we have had uh, many exchanges on conference calls uh, with the GI and the GGL uh, meetings and different um, meetings have been organized by the Commission because the different member states wanted to know what the um, different countries were making and the situation was really volatile. I can only underline the political pressure um, on member states to uh, close the borders from the local regional elected members of parliament. It was really uh, um, surprising to see that uh, some um, members introduced um, border controls and restriction of uh, movement inside their territories and they were um, apologizing, uh, saying that their uh, local MPs were requiring the closure of the borders and a few weeks later the same elected uh, local elected members of parliament were requiring the reopening of the borders so it, it was very difficult a difficult situation that has to be taken into account the issue of the uh, restriction of movement was uh, to restrict the movement of people and not to close borders on coordination, my minister Christophe Castaner was always in touch with the different counterparts of the bordering countries in order to agree on the restrictions that were implemented, the um, easing that was um, put uh, forward for uh, cross border um, workers, for families living on both sides of a border, and all those questions were addressed from the outset. Uh, we agreed on the rules that we would use to um, carry out border checks. Uh, we agreed with Germany. One single country managed the controls for both countries, if you like. We also eased the administrative um, approach because you know that in France you, re you needed to have a document to travel in France, but also to cross the border. Germany had also a document for that uh, to cross the border, and we agreed to have one single document for France and Germany. It's not, of course, the ideal solution, but we had a real will to take into account the daily lives of the people affected by the closure of the border. We had daily exchanges with each and every one of our neighbors. The relationship with the US, the first part of the answer for that question, is 
well, first of all, the United States prohibited travel um, travelers coming into the U.S. from Europe. We are only a part of the answer. The other part is in Washington. Um, well, to, we would need to have a dialogue uh, between the EU and third countries so as to make sure that the solutions approved are the same uh, for all of us. We don't want to have differentiated solutions depending on the member states. So the solution will have to be the same for every member state of the European Union. As I was saying, our goal is, um, well, to improve the situation, to reopen the borders in an organized manner, because we closed them in an organized manner. France has set a deadline for that, the 1st of July. It allows us to take into account, on the one hand, the economic interest and importance of a reopening for tourism, for example. Uh, in, we know that the situation is stabilizing in many member states today. And, uh, of course, uh, we know that the health crisis is still going on in different member states. And it would give us time to organize ourselves in order to have a coordinated reopening with common rules. As was underlined previously, we are a, the sum of different external borders. We, are, we don't have a single border. We all have different borders that we manage together. So we need to have the same arrangements and therefore we need a coordination. We hope that this coordination will be carried out in the next days or weeks based on the proposal of the Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And uh, I have a, a, a question that is maybe of a legal nature, and we have only four minutes left. So I don't know if uh, Jean-Louis maybe wants to to dive into that question. But um, there has been a debate uh, for a while now concerning if public health is to be considered as a ground for reintroducing border controls. Uh, it's not explicitly mentioned in the Schengen Border Code, but uh, the point is sometimes raised that it is still to be seen as a ground since public health is to be considered uh, as, uh, as a public policy issue. Uh, what is your view on this? Could it be possible that the member states imposing border controls actually did so even lacking legal ground for it? I don't know if uh, Jean-Louis, uh, sure. you got the question. I'm trying to, okay, no, sorry. I did not know that you were addressing the question to me in particular, I'm sorry, oh. I, 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 sorry. I missed that. Well, I mean, this has been debated, but okay, I, my take, uh, having been through uh, many, many papers about this, is that, yes, I think that it, 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 is, it, it is well possible to consider it. Uh, okay, I mean, there is a difference, of course, to be made between on the one hand, is it a legal ground, and on the other hand, is it an appropriate measure? I mean, there have been divergence of opinion on whether, I mean, reintroducing control at the internal border were an appropriate way to fight against the pandemics for reasons that were mentioned amongst others uh, by Madame Inetfeld in, in her intervention. But I think that for, for, for as far as the legal ground is concerned, there is, I would say, a majority of, of analysis, uh, analyst, analyst or, 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 or academics who are of the view that, yes, indeed, uh, there was a, a, a such a, a health public health situation can be a basis for the reintroduction of internal border control, provided that, of course, they meet the criteria that were uh, reminded to us by Natasha Berthaud uh, in her initial intervention about proportionality, about individuality, and so on and so forth. And also, I mean, the, de the length of the duration of the of the of these control and of, and the procedural constraints, which are uh, the one existing in the Schengen Border Code for the time being. I hope that this answers your question. If, if I may, if I may add uh, something quickly, uh, I, I would like to stress how important was uh, what uh, Sophie Netfeld has said when she referred to trust. 
as one of the key elements of the Schengen Aki. It's not only trust between population, but it's also trust between states. Uh, and I mean, trust was there from the beginning. Later on, it was complemented by another dimension, which is a dimension of solidarity between uh, Schengen member states. But the solidarity based on, I would say, mutual, uh, well understood mutual self interest. That is to say, that's a solidarity to protect the weakest link in the chain, basically. Uh, it is in this spirit that the agencies have been set up. It is in this spirit that different information systems have been set up. It is in this spirit that the big uh, multi-annual funds have been set up. I mean, the board fund and their successor in the next generation of the MFF uh, still to be discussed uh, be between, between the member states. That has also to be factored into the overall assessment of, I mean, the state of play and the political state of play between member states. Is it a crisis of trust? Is it mistrust and, and lack of confidence? Is it a crisis of solidarity? I mean, this should also be factored into how we are going to build back better, that is to say, come out of this crisis with a more solid Schengen Aki and a renewed governance of the whole uh, Schengen area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this answered one of the questions that came from our viewers about uh, if uh, there will be a future Schengen Forum provide for a real coordination of solidarity uh, needed measures. And I think that the, your answer, Jean-Louis, partly uh, asked that, uh, answered that question. Uh, indeed, it's needed and protecting your weakest link, as you, as you said. Uh, Sophie, the last questions go to you. Um, you mentioned it's a question from our, one of our viewers, so I'd like to take it. And we have been giving the extra few minutes for our last one. You mentioned that the European Commission being shy uh, in the enforcement of its rules over the individual decision making of the member states, particularly during the pandemic what strategy could the eu adopt to overcome this shyness uh, and gain more control and reinforce its authority in terms of crisis okay thanks for that question i'll try and be very quick uh, i think there are, there are lots of things that we can do but there are two things that that come to mind immediately first is uh, also uh, something that was actually mentioned briefly by um, uh, Mr. De Brouwer, uh, and that is the institutional setup of the European Union. As long as the composition of the European Commission is intergovernmental, just a reflection of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the number of member states, um, you know, it's going to be difficult for the European Commission to be really fully and truly independent. Uh, that link could have been broken with the, the the, the Constitutional Treaty uh, and, and even the Lisbon uh, Treaty. And I think uh, making the Commission smaller and not in, intergovernmental is one thing. The second thing is that we as a European Parliament, we have instruments. Why do we always sign a blank check for the member states? We are the budget authority, one of the two budget authorities. Well, let's use that power because we're giving you know, massive amounts of money to, uh, for all the, the Schengen instruments uh, but also Frontex, the external, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the border and coast guard, where the member states, again, do not deliver. So, you know, maybe we should just not sign off the check uh, until they, uh, they, they, they respect the rules. Two solutions. Thank you very much, Sophie, for being so short, but also very rich <laughs> in giving solutions. Um, Thank you once more, uh, everyone, for, for your interventions. Thank you for coming and adhering our invitation and being so generous in sharing your opinions and views and knowledge, of course, uh, with us. And thank you to everyone who has been listening. And uh, we will now uh, move on to our next panel, which will be moderated by my dear colleague, Dragos Tudaresh. Uh, once again, thank you very much for listening. And I'll be also here sitting, listening to you. Here's to you, Dragos. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Abir. Uh, thank, thanks also to all the panelists uh, in the first panel. Very rich uh, interventions. Um, I think we've we've heard 
a good historical evolution of Schengen, what it meant for us as citizens, what it meant for, for the member states, for the Union over the last uh, 35 years since the signature of the Schengen Agreement. We've had an outlook of the institutional and the governance realities that are stressing the fundamental logic of Schengen and how it was envisaged that it should work. Uh, we've talked about trust uh, as a central element in, the, in this fabric uh, of, of Schengen, trust between citizens, trust between governments uh, and their institutions. We've talked about the role of the Commission, um, maybe not enough about the role of the Commission uh, in this whole equation. Um, and maybe we can also, with that, uh, move towards the, the second uh, topic of, of today's webinar uh, and the uh, focus of the second uh, panel, which I'm going to moderate, which is supposed to be about the future. Um, we've, we look at Schengen, um, as I said also in my, in my first intro, uh, our citizens are worried uh, about what they see. Uh, we as, as, as politicians, we are worried uh, about what we hear from our constituencies, uh, about what we see in terms of what the institutions that are meant to, to protect, preserve uh, and, and move Schengen forward uh, are doing and therefore uh, I think we, we have uh, an entitlement to, to ask ourselves what is going to happen next. What is going to happen, first of all, now uh, when we come out of the COVID crisis? Are we better prepared in case we will have a second wave uh, of this pandemic? Or are we going to see a bit of the same uh, cacophony of sounds and measures uh, being taken, being rushed, uh, in case we will have a second wave? I hope we won't, but again, uh, no one can tell us for sure right now what uh, the future months are going to bring. Um, and how do we improve the cooperation between member states? We've heard uh, already in the first panel that uh, we are somewhat content at the level of the, of the member states of the commission with the number of video conferences between ministers, between the working levels, but how much of that is actually, uh, how much of that has been, first of all, communicated and seen by the citizens? Because again, as also some of you already said in the first panel, Schengen is about the symbol um, and what it means for our citizens. And perhaps not enough of that coordination was seen, was properly communicated so that we give citizens a sentiment of trust that we are actually taking care as we should uh, uh, taking care of uh, about of Schengen. Uh, so for all of these questions about future, uh, we have uh, lined up also uh, a very good uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Anki brokers Noll, the Dutch State Secretary for Justice and Security. We have Mr. Raoul Übereken, Director in the General Secretariat of the Council of the European Union. Ms. Diana Schmidt, uh, Advisor for Enhancing External and Internal Policy Aspects of Migration and Security in the European Commission, DG Home, and a former Head of Cabinet for Commissioner Avramopoulos, and uh, our dear friend and colleague, uh, Mrs. Fabian Keller, uh, a member of Renew uh, Europe Group here in the European Parliament. So the rules remain the same, uh, five to seven minutes for each of the panelists. Uh, afterwards, uh, we will be uh, opening to questions. Uh, please use, for those of us that are uh, listening and, and watching us, please use the Q&A function um, and I will be pick, uh, picking up questions from there uh, after the uh, interventions from our panelists. With that, I give the floor to uh, Mrs. Anki brokers Noll, the Dutch State Secretary for Justice and Security. Thank you very much for, for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation, Mr. Tudorachi. I'm happy to be part of this Renew webinar next week on the 14th. It will be 35 years ago that the Schengen Agreement was signed. And Schengen is the standard bearer of the four freedoms of the European Union. Looking back at the uh, past few months, 17 out of 26 Schengen states had reintroduced internal border controls. From that perspective, there is little to celebrate. Nevertheless, I am confident about the future of Schengen, and I will explain why. Five years ago, the 30th birthday of Schengen, 
former commissioner, Mr. Dimitris Avramopoulos, said that, and I quote, removing the control at the borders between the member state, states is one of the most outstanding achievements of European integration, visible to every cross-border traveler. It would not have been possible without the mutual trust between the member states. End of quote. Since then, the Schengen area has faced great challenges. The migration crisis, a persistent terrorist threat, and more recently, the spread of the COVID-19 virus have affected our common area deeply. Nevertheless, his words are as valid today as they were back then. The notion of mutual trust is often used in discussions on the Schengen area. In most cases, mutual trust is used in a negative way by pointing out the finger at a supposed lack of mutual trust between member states as a reason for the persistent internal border controls. I would beg to differ. If I look at the everyday cooperation between the Netherlands and its neighbors to tackle the spread of the COVID-19 virus, and I see this level of cooperation all over Europe, I don't see distrust in each other. Yet, what I do see is that the current Schengen area has systematic deficiencies. And that these deficiencies have led to a reduced sense of control. This is what makes our populations uneasy and provides fertile ground for populists. This loss of trust has to be overcome rapidly and collectively, even more in view of today's and tomorrow's challenges. In short, we need to renew Schengen. But where to start? In my view, renewing Schengen starts at the external border. We have to make sure that we strengthen our infrastructure to make sure that we facilitate legal travel towards the European Union. And at the same time, stop those who have no right of access or who aim to harm. Such an enhanced infrastructure is long overdue and should have been in place 30 years ago at the very 35 years ago at the very beginning of Schengen. While giving free movement to persons, we also gave free movement to illegals, people smugglers and criminals. COVID-19 is another reminder that this needs correction. I'm happy to note that these past few years we have achieved great progress in agreeing between the co-legislators on several important IT systems, including their interoperability. We need to ensure that these systems are implemented properly and on time. Furthermore, we need to strengthen our borders further with adequate registration and identification procedures. Finally, we have to distinguish quickly between those irregular migrants in need of protection and those who have to return by setting up a mandatory border procedure. Secondly, we need to improve our situational awareness. The absence of internal border control should not mean and does not mean the absence of control of, over our borders. The Netherlands managed to do without the reintroduction of border controls because of our good cooperation with our neighbors and because we have an IT system that provides us with a situational picture of what is happening at our borders. The Schengen area should benefit more from these technologies and other IT solutions 
to better understand and control internal movements. Thirdly, we have to improve our governance. Sharing a common area of the free movement means sharing a common standard of implementation of the rules. We have the Schengen evaluation mechanism in place, but we are not using it, it to its full potential. We need open and honest debates about member states' implementation, also on a political level. However, there is a wider issue at stake. The past years have made clear that Schengen is heavily impacted by the implementation of the EU asylum acquis. Deficiencies in the implementation of the asylum acquis in one member state prompts secondary movements towards others. This harms public support for the Schengen area and has led to the reintroduction of internal border controls. In my opinion, we can prevent this if we monitor the implementation of the asylum acquis more closely. That is why I hope that we can conclude the European Agency for Asylum Regulation as soon the AU, EU, AA regulation as soon as possible. I think it is also the responsibility of, polit of politicians and policy makers alike to provide safeguards if the system is not able to protect the integrity of the Schengen area. My preferred option would be to have police checks instead of internal border controls. In other words, to have control borders instead of border controls. However, if the situation demands more string stringent measures, the reintroduction of temporary internal border controls should remain possible as a last resort option to protect the well-functioning parts of the Schengen area. In the, that last resort scenario, member states should have the same possibility as at the external border. Ladies and gentlemen, just a few more concluding remarks. Over the last five years, we have seen many member states opting to unilateral measures in an attempt to safeguard control over internal security and stability and, recently, public health. Although I think we all agree on the common goal to return to fully open Schengen area as soon as possible, it would be a mistake to deny the political rationale behind those measures. It is the need to be in control which is imperative for any political community. It has become painfully evident that the current European framework does not provide for that need. Neither the Schengen acquis nor the common European asylum system currently provide for effective remedies for the system's weaknesses in design and implementation. As a result, unequally distributed migration pressure has caused rifts in the Schengen area. Therefore, I urgently call for a more robust and resilient Schengen area and a targeted reform of the common European asylum system to answer to the challenges of present day Schengen. Only if we work together, unilateral measures become superfluous. And only then we can ensure an open, safe and well-functioning Schengen area, which is, I repeat it, the standard bearer of the four freedoms of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, State Secretary. Um, you've touched upon already uh, um, a good number of points. You've talked about the structural deficiencies um, and also how they are feeding uh, populism. Um, I would um, also wish to, to, to touch upon that later on. Um, 
in our concluding remarks because I think it's an important element to, to, to discuss. You've talked about renewing Schengen uh, and what your view was on how we do that, uh, looking at the instruments, the infrastructure, as you mentioned, at the new technologies uh, that we already have and those that we can maybe still develop to help us better manage borders. Uh, you also talked about the governance, common standards, um, and how we apply rules. Uh, all very important uh, points. Um, I will now uh, move on to the second speaker in our panel, uh, Mr. Raoul Uberekin, Director in the General Secretary of the Council of the European Union. Raoul, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Dragos, and uh, thanks uh, so much for the kind invitation and having me. Um, let, let me do uh, maybe two uh, prelim preliminary remarks and then, and then three more, more substantive uh, points. Um, the, the first preliminary remark is that um, we should not uh, make the mistake of reducing uh, Schengen or the Schengen area just to issues of, of border migration and asylum. Um, I mean, the treaty defines uh, the area of freedom, security and, and, and justice as the area without internal border controls in which a number of things are, are assured. And there is not only borders and migration, there is also police cooperation, customs cooperation and, and judicial cooperation uh, in particular in criminal matters. So I think the, the area of freedom, security and justice should be seen as, as, as a whole uh, in this. And, also, and I think this is important when we look at the, um, the the tools that we that we might have that we might need and the ones and the reforms that we might need to, need to do. Um, the, the second point is um, on uh, the the language we use sometimes when uh, internal border controls are, are reintroduced. Uh, I, I think we should be careful of um, not over dramatizing. Uh, it in every case. Um, uh, I know there's a big debate out there and the first panel spoke about it, about are some of the border controls that are in place, in particular the migration ones, justified uh, or, or not. Uh, but uh, my point is just to say that reintroducing internal border controls has been one of the safeguards in the Schengen uh, regime from the system, from, from the start. Uh, I mean, if you look at the, the, the original Schengen implementing convention, uh, Article 2 says we lift internal border controls, uh, the, and the second paragraph of the same article says, well, when needed, uh, you, we can nevertheless reintroduce them. So it, it, so it is one of the fundamental safeguards that the system, that the system has. Uh, so um, I'll just make the point that we should not um, over-dramatize that argument uh, and, 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 and have a, a proportionate approach to it. On my more substantive uh, points, um, if you look at uh, the Schengen border code and the substance of it, um, when you look at the, re the, the criteria for the reintroduction of internal border controls, um, actually what the code says is you can reintroduce in certain circumstances border controls. What the code does not say um, is what you are allowed to control at the border. Now, we assume that if you reintroduce them for term security reasons, uh, that it is because you want to catch a criminal or a terrorist that, uh, that, that might be fleeing and, and so on and so forth. So it's rather straightforward what you would instruct your, your, your policemen or your border guards to check. Same if you reintroduce internal border control from a migration point of view, well, you're probably are going to check that the third country national uh, fulfilled the criteria as set out in the Schengen Border Code for, uh, for legal, legal entry and stay in, in, in the Schengen territory. But when it comes to health, um, it, there is nothing. Or when it comes more generally sort of to a situation outside of the two I described before, there is nothing. And the answer here is actually not to be found in the Schengen Border Code. The answer is to be found on the rules on free movement. So when we're looking at um, is what the member states did proportionate or not, justified or not, you need to, um, the benchmark is to be found in, in, in the free movement directive. It is not in the Schengen rules. So you need to link, to read these two texts together. And I think you probably need to link them better together if, if, if we would go uh, for, for, uh, for reform. The same goes in a way for the external borders. 
um, one of the one of the criteria that we that the, the Schengen border code foresees for entry to the to the territory is that a, a third country national does not pose a, a health uh, related risk. But that's all. It is not further defined, nor are there any criteria to to um, to to uh, by by which the third country national could prove that he is not uh, posing a, a health a health related uh, risk. Um, uh, nor do we have, uh, by the way, uh, in, in the code, uh, the necessary legal basis to further define that by way of implementing or, or delegated act. Uh, so I think to that I'm already sort of hinting at, at possible avenues of uh, where, where probably legislation could be, could be adapted and, and could, be, could be reformed. Um, then my second point is on, on, on more procedural aspects. Um, on the internal border controls, member states are obliged to notify. Uh, they do so, but they do so in a very general way. Um, what one could foresee, and what the Commission actually could could have done in this situation, is to ask more precisely to member states, well, what are you actually checking at the internal border? So what are the restrictions that your border guards are or your policemen are instructed to check at the external at the, at the internal at the internal border where such controls have been have been re reintroduced? Then on the decision taking, again, this has, I think, already been addressed in particular by Jean-Louis de Brouwer. Um, the question is, should we not foresee for certain circumstances that the decision can be taken at EU level? We have Article 29, but uh, Article 29 is, is not applicable uh, in, in the current circumstances uh, because it, it has a condition in, in, in there which, sees that, which says that uh, the... Um, the, the functioning of, of, uh, of the Schengen area is put at risk as a result of persistent serious deficiencies relating to the external border control. Now, obviously, that is not the case with, with, with the health pandemic. Um, so probably looking at that, uh, that line here, this restriction here, uh, might, might be a way of, of finding uh, a quick way of, of actually giving us a, a better tool to address this at, at European level. And, and by the way, this, this, this could, in theory, if, if, if member states in the parliament would, would agree, uh, be done very, very quickly by, by the co-legislators if, if the commission would, uh, would come forward with, with, with such a, a proposal. Um, in, the, in the absence of uh, anything in the code now, um, there are ways where member states could um, coordinate beyond sort of the exchange of information and, 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 and the video conferences that, that have, been, have been talked about. Um, one, in, one instrument that member states, uh, or let's say the Commission and member states, or the Commission and the Council, have at their dispos disposal is recommendations. Um, the Commission has chosen in the current situation to sort of give guidance through communications and, and other types of documents. But the, the Commission could go a step further and, and adopt a very clear recommendation. I mean, the question we're currently debating, and uh, the Commission, I think, is issuing today, today or has issued today a communication on uh, reopening the, the, the Schengen area to, to third countries, um, uh, is, well, which countries? Which third countries will we reopen to? We obviously need a very, very coordinated approach uh, to, to, to this question uh, so in order to avoid uh, amongst others, in order to avoid that member states reintroduce internal border controls because of an uncoordinated opening of the external borders. And here the Commission could come forward with a recommendation having a list of countries, uh, of third countries in there. Or the Commission, if, 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 the, if the Commission feels like putting the ball more in, into the camp of, of the member states, uh, under Article 292 of the treaty, the Commission could come forward with a proposal for a Council recommendation, and it would then be for the Council to, to, to negotiate and adopt that to give further guidance uh, to, to, to member states. My, my, my third point I wanted to make is, uh, is one that I think one part of the Schengen Aki uh, that we should look at is, is the one on police cooperation. Uh, it, it, it is a part of the acquis that has not been uh, really um, revisited, I should say, uh, nearly since, since the beginnings of, of the Schengen area, um, uh, except for, for, for Europol and, and a few other things. And I think there's a real need here uh, to modernize um, and to go a step further, also on very practical issues. One of, this, one of the um, elements we've, uh, we've, we've that be, 
became very apparent now with with the current uh, uh, situation is secure channels of communication for police forces across across borders uh, in in a very modern modern form, uh, be it through apps and others. You know, how do you communicate um, uh, through very secure channels uh, with, with with Europol? Um, uh, other issues to be looked at is we have all over Europe uh, the so-called um, uh, customs and and, uh, and pol police cooperation centers, which are in both areas. Um, that is a huge, huge network of of, uh, of centers where police and customs work together on a daily basis. Now, how can we link them better up uh, also to the European level? Is I think something we we, we can explore. And 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 the last uh, instrument I think that that needs revisiting is uh, is Prum. Um, uh, I mean, some of the speakers uh, spoke about uh, having rather uh, sort of police controls rather than border controls in the current situation. Well, one of the uh, one of the instruments that the Prum decisions and the Prum Treaty provides for is is joint uh, joint police patrols, and we have a lot of that in in bilateral police treaties as well. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of that be, being used uh, at present, where, whereas it could. I mean, it could even be used as it has been in the past, for example. Uh, in, in in tourist destinations, if you want to make sure that your um, your, your German, your Dutch, uh, your, your Luxembourg, your Polish tourists, when being in I don't know in Spain, Croatia, or, or Greece, observes the the health rules there, well, under on, under on Prum, uh, member states could organise uh, joint patrols so that it is easier to explain to their citizens once they're on their holiday destinations what are the health rules they need to observe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's always easier when you can communicate to the populations in, in, in your own language. And it's a tool that has been used in other occasions, big events uh, uh, and so on, tourist hotspots and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, but it is, I think, an instrumentarium that, uh, that is worth uh, revisiting. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. You've, um, you've touched upon a question that I had myself and I was preparing to, to, to raise to, to all of you as a panel which is whether in times like this, when the usual reflex is to say, oh, we have a crisis, let's rush quickly and ask for new legislation or new rules, whether actually what we need is new rules or whether we need to look better at the rules we have uh, and make sure that we actually apply them. Uh, so uh, you've already um, entered uh, or, or gave uh, part of that answer. Maybe we can uh, come back to it in the Q&A session. Uh, thanks a lot for your intervention, and now I move on to the third panelist, uh, which is Diana Schmidt. Uh, now, Diana, you, you were at the very epicenter um, at the, of the uh, migration crisis in 2015, 2016, uh, and, and uh, what followed uh, as the head of cabinet of, of Commissioner Avramopoulos. So you have a, a unique perspective over what has been happening over the last few years uh, with the Schengen area. The entanglement between uh, Schengen and internal border controls and migration and migration realities. Uh, so with that, I'm not asking you to look uh, necessarily uh, back uh, at that period, but with that experience and that backdrop, uh, how do you see the future of, of Schengen? Uh, what do you see uh, to be possible uh, innovations uh, or better application of the rules we have so that we actually uh, move Schengen forward rather than, than backwards. Uh, Diana, please, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Drago. Thank you for the invitation and for this uh, very timely de debate. Uh, you, you know that on Sunday we will celebrate the 35th anniversary of Schengen, and uh, it's really time to look at Schengen again and, and to learn from the past. You, you mentioned the crisis. I, uh, I was following and managing together with, uh, uh, in support of Commissioner Ramopoulos uh, in the last uh, five years. We had the migration uh, crisis and, and we had also the terrorist uh, threats. Uh, so it was, it was quite heavy. Um, the pandemic we are facing right now is, is a little bit different. Uh, and it's exactly also as Raoul explained, uh, the mechanism is different and we need really to have uh, a, a coherent, broader approach in order to, to address uh, what we are just facing. Only to note something is, uh, from my experience, uh, when we had uh, the migration flows, but also the terrorist, terrorist threats, um, 
some considered free movement in Schengen as being a threat as such, uh, mm -hmm. because people were moving around, uh, created risk for our security and, and so on, uh, which, uh, which was ob obviously not, uh, not, not, not the case. But um, today I have the impression that we are in a, in a different situation because citizens and businesses also realize what uh, Schengen means. And Schengen is one of the biggest achievements of Europe. So it, it, it shows also what Europe means and what Schengen means. Free movement of persons, free movement of, of goods. So um, everyone is somehow, um, has, has, is somehow impacted to what is happening right now. Because we cannot see families, because we cannot move, because simply we do not know if we can go on holidays, because we do not find the goods. So I think we should also build on this on this positive um, uh, mood, which which was probably created um, um, in order to 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 build on 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 the past and to take into account the challenges. That being said, of course, the situation in which we are right now is is not an ideal situation. And uh, at the beginning, everyone was was taken by surprise, and we were not prepared. We were prepared to deal with migration. Uh, challenges. Uh, you know, also in March we had uh, massive arrivals from from Turkey, and the Commission uh, and also the European Union reacted, especially also Greece reacted very quickly. Probably we would not have been in the same position um, if uh, we we would not have prepared and to have the measures now on our table, uh, which were adopted uh, and agreed uh, during the last uh, five years. Um, so, uh, however, the pandemic is is, is something uh, new. State secretary, like like also other participants in the in the previous meetings, underlined the, the, the question of of trust. Uh, trust between member states is extremely important, and the dialogue between member states during the migration crisis, there there were neighbors um, uh, working closely together, having a close economic links. Uh, they did not, the ministers did not speak anymore together. I mean, at that time, I really thought it was the end of Europe. Um, we, we saw uncoordinated position at the be beginning of the crisis. And uh, I think it was very good that everyone at the end uh, was sitting around the same table or at least uh, in the same video conference in order to exchange information and, and to coordinate. It's it's correct, it's very difficult for, for health-related issues of, and for a pandemic uh, to put on the table a, a proposal or to take a specific initiative. But the Commission was quite active with, with guidelines and, and guidance, which were, were also extremely welcome uh, by, 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 the, by the Member States and, and by the Council. And, uh, and now, a few, a few weeks later, I think we are in a much better position, and we have to build on what we what we learned uh, from uh, from this. Um, so, where are we going now? What 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 is the future? Um, I think the first the first point, which is extremely important, and which was repeated by different participants. And by the way, I would like really like to to thank you for inviting me because it's 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 interesting to to listen to all of you. Uh, uh, while uh, we are still reflecting on, on, on what we are going uh, to put on the table uh, in the context of the, the pact uh, on, uh, on migration and asylum. So I think this is extremely timely uh, to, to, to get also some, some feedback uh, from all these uh, eminent participants. Uh, but something which was, was said again and again, and as I said also, is, is, is trust. We have to restore trust and we have to continue also in future uh, with a more uh, strong, stronger role on coordination, exchange of information, monitoring and guidance uh, for, for member states and um, in order to, to avoid situation we were fa facing uh, during the migration crisis, during terrorist threats, but also now, especially during COVID. The, the second point, uh, which was also mentioned already, and I'm sorry if I repeat some of the points, but uh, uh, what is important is, the, is an effective management of the external borders. This does not mean closing external borders, but this means managing better external borders. 
Uh, this means allowing mobility at the same time, avoiding that there are deficiency, which would put the, the whole Schengen area at risk. Um, we have taken quite uh, some quite bold measures with an, an upgrade of, of Frontex and the creation of the European Border and Coast Guard, which will be further reinforced and, uh, and uh, this, this is now being implemented. Uh, we have um, created new systems, uh, the, the STRD and the exit system. We have upgraded old systems and are working on the interoperability of all these this systems so that they speak to each other in order to to have a clear change and availability of, of, of information. Um, and we have also to look probably in future at, at our visa policy and, and see also if it's fit for purpose in a, a new uh, digital uh, area. The third point uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, this will be clearly developed in our new pact on, on migration and asylum, is uh, the importance of a common European uh, migration and asylum system, uh, especially the asylum system. Um, you know that 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 in the past, um, when we had this big pressure and a lot of flows of migrants around Europe, it was also due to the fact that uh, the, the the asylum procedures, uh, the 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 rules in the different member states uh, variated a lot. Um, we have put on the table at that time a proposal. Some some of them also thanks to the to the Parliament are very close uh, um, of um, of an agreement. Others uh, which are more linked to to issues also related to solidarity and responsibility are still on the table. And uh, and as I said, the Commission will come uh, come up in the coming weeks with with a new approach uh, where we we will. Um, built on, on, on uh, the experience and the discussions with the European Parliament and the Council in the past in order to come, come up with new ideas because it's extremely important to have a, a new asylum and uh, migration comprehensive approach. Uh, the fourth point is uh, in the area of, of internal security. Criminals do not know uh, borders, be it external borders, and it's not internal borders which will, will make the difference, um, but but other approaches uh, which have already also been developed and which have to be further developed, uh, like also Raoul uh, mentioned, uh, police cooperation, uh, joint, uh, joint uh, teams um, across the border. Um, in the short term, um, of course, now the priority is to lift uh, the restriction at the internal border. Uh, you followed uh, the, certainly the, the outcome of the, the last uh, video conference uh, of the ministers last Friday. There was a majority of member states uh, will lift the restriction on the 15th of, of June. Uh, several others indicated that they would need a little bit more time uh, until the uh, end, end of the month. The Commission, of course, is in favor of having a lifting as, as quickly and as, as soon as, as possible. And uh, if uh, restriction have to, uh, to, to stay, it has to be, of course, non-discriminatory, proportionate, and, and really only on a, a, a needed, if, if, if it's really needed. Um, what is uh, perhaps a little bit more complicated, uh, but which will also have, we have to happen uh, in the gradual phase, is uh, uh, the lifting uh, of the restriction on uh, non-essential travel for, for third countries. Um, uh, during the discussions at uh, ministerial level, um, there was a clear feeling that this will probably not happen in the, in the next days and that perhaps a, a few more days will be needed. It's very difficult for me, Dragos, to speak about this because our commissioner will give a a press conference in 10 minutes uh, because we uh, today we, we propose uh, an approach how we see the, the lifting of the, the restriction uh, at the external border. So uh, it's, it's difficult for me to, to give you information here. I could imagine that there is a short extension perhaps until end of the month and it's clear also and this goes, goes also out from previous discussions, so I'm not, uh, not preempting what will be said, but uh, uh, that uh, this has to be done in a non-discriminatory way, that there must be a coordinated approach that has to be based on 
the pandemic situation and situation obviously in, in, in third countries. Raoul, I can uh, not reply to you now today, but uh, I, I propose to all of you to follow uh, the press conference or perhaps to, to, to look at, uh, at uh, the press releases which will come out uh, if our meeting is not over. Um, but I do not exclude that we will give already some clear indications concerning some uh, specific, uh, specific member states. Now, looking um, also at the future, I will not go uh, to, into all the details. I think Raoul has, has done a, a very good um, expose and very interesting uh, and very concrete. Uh, what, what, is, what is important is really that, that, that we look also at alternatives to, um, to border checks and, and restrictions in the future. When it's about health issue, one can, of course, uh, imagine, uh, envisage uh, health checks, uh, social distancing. Uh, you see how airports are preparing, uh, what is happening already at some borders. I think we will not get out of this very quickly. So um, also the question is, what if there's a second wave? Uh, we were not prepared in February, March. We are better prepared now. And uh, we will also have to anticipate and to follow the epidemic situation more closely. This is exactly what we are also doing in relation to, to migration. Um, we are following what is happening in the countries around us. Um, and we are following what the movements within, within Europe. So anticipation is key, key and also being prepared uh, for, for any other event. Um, we have also, I think, for the future, uh, in, if we speak about alternatives, the, the second important issue, in my opinion, is also the, the use of, of technologies. I think the new technologies can be quite, quite useful, uh, including also for, for exchange of, of information and reinforced uh, cross-border cooperation, like it can be uh, uh, in relation to police checks, um, but, but also um, you, you, you know, for, 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 for the COVID, there was quite some increase in, in border cooperation with uh, transfer of, um, of also patients from one country to the other, but then also in relation to uh, regional approaches uh, in, in order to see how one can lift quickly um, the, um, the restriction. I think um, we have to think about regional approaches or approaches um, which, um, uh, which, which take, however, into account uh, the, the, the situation of the pandemic in, in the different regions. So if, if the situation is the same and, 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 and the measures have been taken and, and, and it's, it's positive, I mean, one can imagine to have a more coherent approach in different areas without creating um, discriminations. Now coming to, to legislation, um, there it will also you know that we have made a proposal um, to change the Schengen border code some time ago. It's, it's blocked. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will take, uh, take a position on, on how to go forward. And, and the ideas we had at the end uh, of last year or beginning of new this, this year uh, are probably now evolved because of COVID, because this created a, a, a new, uh, a new uh, challenge and, and, and a new approach. So we will look into, into, into a new legislation, but I do not say that we will present it. Um, uh, you said rightly, Dragos, it's also sometimes a question of, of implementation. Uh, and um, we, we will see how we can better use also the Schengen evaluation system uh, and also perhaps uh, to speed a little bit up uh, um, the, the follow-up of the Schengen evaluations in order to um, to address uh, deficiencies should, which could exist in, in, in different uh, Schengen states or, or, or member states. Uh, what I want to say, uh, this is also some, something uh, which was said before, uh, all this is not only about, about Schengen and about borders, because for example, COVID, it's really it goes much, it's much broader than the home affairs or even justice area. And, and to get back to a, a normal functioning of Schengen, we have to take into account all the measures which, which, which can help to get back to, to a normal functioning of, of Schengen. 
Um, I think I, it's better I stop here. Um, and again, I invite you all to, to, to follow, to follow um, and to, to look at uh, the papers we are going to present today, which will also cover uh, visa because you, you know uh, there was some coordination on visa and and, and uh, e visas were not issued as as before so probably we'll come out also with some ideas on how to restart uh, the the visa issue in the future thank you very much thank you very much Diana you certainly made us very curious and eager um, hopefully not rushing out of the uh, webinar uh, but eager to follow the press releases after the press conference of, of uh, Commissioner Johansson um, yes um, I think one of the issues that also uh, the colleagues in the first panel uh, clearly mentioned was uh, the role that the Commission has here so um, communications such as the one today are I think fundamental for marking a bit signposting what the future steps can be and giving also that uh, feeling of control um, of trust uh, back to the citizens that, that uh, Schengen is in, in the right hand. So I'm certainly hoping that today's communication is, is one that is ambitious, that is forthcoming, uh, that is really looking at the, at the needs, uh, but also at the symbol and the symbolism of Schengen, which, which I think we all want to preserve. Uh, that brings me to Fabienne, um, our last speaker in this panel. Now, uh, Fabienne is the former mayor of Strasbourg, um, a city that almost literally sits uh, on uh, probably one of the most symbolic borders of Europe, uh, the border between France and Germany, and not any border between France and Germany. And um, I think with that perspective enough, uh, it would be uh, very interesting to hear Fabienne's thoughts but also uh, Fabienne as our lead uh, member uh, when it comes to the Dublin reform, I think will also have a very uh, interesting perspective in terms of how we will be continuing to entangle or disentangle migration and, and border policies in the future. Um, and then maybe one uh, reminder to our uh, followers, our audience, um, please use the Q&A uh, function. We are now getting close to the end of the panel and then we'll move to the uh, questions and answers. So please do not forget to put your questions in the Q&A uh, with that. Uh, and of course, also our colleagues, members of parliament who would want to, to intervene, I would ask uh, at the end of this panel. So Fabienne, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Dragos. Merci, uh, Abu. Uh, Thank you very much, Dragos, for organizing this webinar on this uh, important topic for our citizens, um, which uh, alludes to what's going to happen in the next days and the reform of Schengen. Thanks also to all the participants. Thank you for um, saying a lot already. Um, so uh, maybe I will uh, sum up some points and share with you some ideas about uh, prospects. So first of all, um, there are three big uh, steps for the Schengen system. First of all, the massive arrivals of migrants in 2015, the terrorist attacks in France with the Bataclan disaster, but also in Germany, Austria and Belgium. And thirdly, the pandemics. It was already mentioned, the national reflexes uh, prevailed. Borders were closed, long queues at the borders, controls, also disruption in the supply chain of some um, products. All of that happened at all borders at this, uh, during this pandemic, which was a real shock. Um, one observation, we were not ready, we were not prepared to face such an epidemic, such a pandemic. The dialogue and coordination mechanisms were not in place and it shows one of the big weaknesses of the Schengen system, the current system, and also of its uh, monitoring. 
Dragos was kind enough to remind you that I'm from Strasbourg. It is the seat of the European Parliament. I'm deeply committed to it and I would like to share my experience. Many people live on both sides of the Rhine in a very natural way. French pupils go to school in Germany and German people come to school in, in Strasbourg because their parents want them to learn French properly. Many people work on both sides of the border. Students keep on going to school uh, in France of Germany um, fully or during their Erasmus. The institutions coordinate their working. We have a Euro district in Strasbourg. We have several of them in Alsace. We have big regions. We have the high re uh, Rhine region with the Bad Württemberg. And we have also the Renania Ren Palatina region with the Luxembourg. We have many interconnections. And because of the crisis, everything stopped many bridges along the uh, Franco-German border uh, closed. The last time it happened was during the war. It was a terrible shock for peoples that were used to that free movement. It was, for them, it was their life. It was um, reality. They were not able to go to, um, the, to the theater on the other side of the border, to go and see their friends, to go and work, to study. And it is still the case today. People can keep now go to work on the other side of the border. A person from Strasbourg working in Germany cannot, and I believe it's still not the case, uh, go to a shop in Germany. He was sanctioned if he did so. It was um, really going backwards. When those people lived Europe in intensively, I uh, supported a young girl because she was studying dance in Germany. She got injured. And to go under surgery at the end of May, she had to fill five documents and go to Germany while making sure to go under quarantine for 15 days. At the end of the day, she was not forced to do that. But at first, it had been announced. It was really shocking. And we go through that really intensely especially for those of us that are really committed and who cherish Europe. For us, it is key, it is urgent. We have to, re, uh, to reintroduce the free movement of people and make sure that the only restrictions that are kept are related to the sanitary situation. On the short term, it is about reopening uh, borders and lifting con uh, controls at the borders. I have another proposal. It is um, a return of experience. It retakes, as the militaries say. They always do that after an exercise to see what was well done, what should have been improved as well, and how we could make sure that in the future we fare better. My offer is that during the summer we organize such a retax. And so we would be better organized, for example, if there is a second wave. Or if there is another problem. If there is another pandemic, it will be different. But if we uh, are prepared, we will be able to resist better to an ex external shock. About the proposal for the Schengen reform, I think my points will echo some of the proposals that have been mentioned earlier on. We have, of course, the issue of the strengthening of our external border. Uh, Professor De Brouwer told us that it is only an addition of borders, so we have to gear up Frontex and we have to deploy the uh, personnel that will going to that are going to support the uh, coast guards and the border guards. Uh, several um, speakers, the minister um, talked about uh, the relationship with the asylum that is reformed right now. 
on that, Renew um, drafted an excellent paper, and I see Malik and Jan Christoph who coordinated it to share all position on those asylum and migration issues. Before the um, long expected proposals of the Commission on that issue. Then we have the uh, question of governance, of cooperation mechanisms, of mutual trust. We see it's really complicated because we have many texts. There have been mentions, directives, regulation with different scopes, but they are interdependent, interconnected. And it is highly complicated to enter in a new system. We need to strike a new balance. That's true for asylum and migration, also for Schengen. And we need to strike a new balance where trust is strengthened and therefore a de-coordination between member states. So how can we manage that transition from one mechanism, Schengen migration, to a new one? with negotiation deadlines in mind and we are all familiar with that in the institutions. Then we will have to inform our fellow citizens because the expectations are quite high on that issue. I would like to share a very concrete story and um, we have many uh, French citizens who have family ties with um, uh, northern African countries, they are used to go back to see their families in northern Africa. They cross internal borders at first and then a Schengen border. How can we make sure that that uh, habit can be preserved this year? We should reflect on that, we should uh, keep in mind the procedure and we should also keep in mind the lives of our fellow citizens and uh, how they um, experience those mechanisms we put in place so that this big European achievement is a reality. Thanks again to Dragos and to Abir for organizing this very interesting webinar in order to try and make progress together on this very important topic of Schengen. Thank you very much Merci everyone. Beaucoup, uh, Fabien. Thank you very Thank much, you very Fabien. Much. Um, now we have reached the end of the uh, list of, of uh, speakers for our second panel. Um, this is the time before uh, before opening to questions. This is the time when also uh, my uh, colleagues, other members of parliament who would wish to intervene, I would ask them to, to do so. I know that uh, Malik Asmani, our colleague also in Libe, uh, also wanted to, to say a few words. Um, so I would ask him to intervene now. And other colleagues, please, uh, let yourselves known in the chat function if you would like to intervene now before the Q&A. Malik, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dragos, and thank you very much also the panelists, of course, uh, to provide uh, us for all your information and to share it, uh, because uh, Schengen is an, a huge achievement, uh, and we need to also to protect that achievement, because it's, in my opinion, not forgiven. Uh, but we need to work each day uh, on it. Um, and that means also uh, that, in my opinion, uh, a state without borders uh, is, uh, in my opinion, a field state. Uh, and, and that means not that you need to build walls, uh, but that means that you have some rules and that you, of course, also have some restrictions uh, and that you need also to enforce. And what I think that we need to learn is that we are at trust in each other as EU member states, but we didn't uh, have enforce uh, our, uh, our external uh, borders. And we need uh, to do that. And uh, I know for sure uh, that there also will be proposals by the European Commission uh, in, for example, in the asylum immigration package uh, uh, to, uh, to, improve, uh, to improve that. Uh, perhaps because uh, I see also uh, Ms. Brookes Knoll, is she still there? Or, because otherwise it's a little bit strange to, uh, to raise questions uh, of that. Because we, we are always uh, thinking uh, when we talk about land borders and external borders uh, on the east and the south part of the European Union. Uh, but we often forget also that our external borders are also at our airport and 
have wanted to ask uh, what her advice, for example, is of her, her practical idea uh, from experiences also, um, what we need to take on board uh, to make the Schengen area more stronger and also future proof. Because otherwise, we focus only to the south part of the European Union, but it's in each member state we have an external board. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Um, I am looking now to see if if I have any other colleagues, members who would want to ask questions. Um, if not, maybe I will take one question um, already, which I would like to put forward to all panelists, including uh, some of the panelists remaining from the first panel. Um, I see uh, Ambassador Stefanik still with us, so uh, any that would like to pitch in, please do so. Uh, first question would be um, linking, I think, to something that uh, Jean-Louis de Brouwer said in the first panel, uh, which is whether we are ready, and when I see we, I refer to a collective we uh, at the European Union level, all institutions and member states alike. Are we ready for a more centralized management uh, of borders, uh, both when it comes to external borders, but also when it comes to decisions related to the internal borders? Um, I, I don't have a particular target for this question. Uh, I, I would have wished that some of the representatives of governments would still be around because I think uh, it would be for them to, to, to answer. But uh, I see Fabienne who would like to, to um, have a first attempt. Fabienne, please. Yes, I can feel it on the Dublin case on which I'm working at the moment. We need to build trust and shared governance. For instance, we have EASO, that's the beginning of an agency. This, this is interesting. We suggest to support it. It meets twice a year. I suggest they meet every fortnight, every 15 days, so that we do not only handle principles. We could work together, depending on what is happening throughout the year. And then together, we could work at the European level even if the implementation will remain national. But we need more trust and a common support, and we need shared knowledge to feed our practices. And there's room for improvement. Um, any of the other panelists would want to attempt a, a reply to the question about uh, a more centralized management for external or internal borders? Raul Diana, if not, I will move to the second question. The second question uh, coming from uh, a, a concern that comes from, from many citizens, but also from, from scholars. I have uh, seen it in, in many articles written in the last few weeks uh, about Schengen which is the tendency observed already in declarations coming, and not only declarations, but actual actions, uh, governmental actions taken in, in some member states or countries associated to Schengen, which is to regionalize solutions. Um, and the fear that I have uh, seen in uh, the questions of many citizens is where would that leave Europe? So if we somewhat uh, develop a, a ecosystem around, let's say, the Scandinavian countries and an ecosystem around the Benelux and an ecosystem around Central European countries, somewhat, unfortunately also, and I think with, with a great danger, somewhat also following certain uh, historical uh, lines, uh, where does it leave Europe? Where does it leave European solutions and a coherent future for the governance of, of Schengen. And again, unfortunately, this is not only a hypothetical issue. Uh, we have already seen uh, some, some either statements or actions that are going in that direction. And maybe also extrapolating a bit uh, outside, is there 
also a risk that we see that also at a more global level, putting Europe uh, in, a, in a situation and European Union in a situation to, to, uh, to uh, act in a certain way on the global stage, um, either because of a risk of, of um, a further wave of the pandemic or certain or similar uh, health related situations or for security or migration related reasons. So um, how do we fight? Do we think that this risk of regionalization um, of creating micro uh, ecosystems, um, uh, is this a real risk and how do we, how do we deal with that? Now again, an open question. It's not addressed to anyone in particular. Um, anyone who would like to intervene? Dragos, should I should I give it a try at it? Please, 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 Raul. Um, I, I actually think the risk is is very little um, because of the consequence. Because the consequence is enormous. It is simply the end, the, the, the end, the end of Schengen. Um, it, I mean, the, the way the whole Schengen, Schengen area is built, the element of, uh, of coherence, the element of trust, uh, the element of uh, the same rules the, and the, um, uh, the harmonized uh, application of the rules in practice are absolutely key. I mean, that's why um, we, we have Schengen evaluations uh, in the system. You know, where, where member states check on each other that they actually apply the rule day in, day out um, and, and, and all that. So if you start creating um, small areas where the rules would be different, where the, um, uh, the conditions would be different and so on, uh, I, I think that, that will then the whole area would, would simply ec explode. And, uh, and it might be interesting uh, to have theoretical discussions about that, but I don't think it is a, it is a sustainable thought. Thank you, Raoul. Um, anyone else with with an answer to that? No. Well, um, last question that uh, that I had here on the list was about uh, technologies. Um, and enhanced infrastructure, as also uh, Madam State Secretary was, was referring to it, which is that many see the future of our border management, but both when it comes to, to external borders, or maybe in particular when it comes to external borders, but also related to internal borders, they see a future that relies uh, more and more on technology, relies more on systems that we have already started uh, either developing or deploying. We have the Visa information system, the Schengen information system, uh, we have Dublin, we are working on the entry exit system, ATIAS, so on and so forth. Um, we have PNR also, not to forget uh, that, and I've heard voices saying that maybe PNR or an extension of PNR could also be used to, to, uh, to look at the health situation of passengers boarding planes. So there are many uh, advancing, um, let's say, a vision of a future uh, management of borders that centers around technologies. Um, and we also know that, for example, now in the context of COVID, we had this debate, which is still ongoing, uh, about using apps, for example, to trace our movements, to trace possible uh, contamination with the virus. This, from my point of view, comes in contrast with, with our drive towards uh, privacy, towards protecting something that is so uh, fundamental to us as Europeans, which is our rights to, to, a, to a private life. Um, so how much of, of that are we prepared to surrender for, uh, let's say, a more technologically driven, probably more efficient in terms of, of streamlining mobility across borders, um, but are we ready to, or prepared politically to also move uh, past the current goalposts in terms of, uh, in terms of the systems that we are envisaging um, by sacrificing, I think, inevitably, uh, some of what we believe are um, key data protection uh, rights that, that, that we hold dear to our hearts. So, how do we see, how do the panelists see this, this uh, possible tension between going further with 
the use of technology and, and, and private life. Any any panelists? I see no one daring to 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 address this question. <laughs> Fabienne. <laughs> oui, je je viens dire un mot, mais je pas. Yes, uh, uh, I can say a few words about that. We had a deep debate about tracking apps regarding COVID. COVID. And many concerns were raised regarding privacy and personal data. But we also realized that we already gave a lot of things to Google, Apple, on social media, on our uh, phones, smartphones. So there are a lot of things to take into account when we talk about technology. But let's be clear, everything is not transparent at the moment when it comes to uh, technology stakes are high why well because technology is like a technique it can be well used or not just like science so we must put some safeguards ensure the right uh, to be forgotten we need to ensure privacy and protection of personal data can we improve technologies what kind of new technological solutions can we implement these are very vast questions and it is difficult to answer such questions at the moment because citizens are sometimes very worried or not worried at all depending on one or the other technology obviously this will be important, but we need to reflect on it with our citizens. Uh, thank you, Fabien. Um, I'm reminded that we have uh, only four more minutes uh, of translation and therefore um, we need to close, uh, which means that I will attempt to draw some conclusions um, from our discussions. And once again, before we may be uh, abruptly interrupted, I would like to really thank uh, all the panelists for for joining us today and for giving their insights into this very um, topical uh, concern. A concern that comes from our citizens and this is where I would like to start my conclusions. Um, in fact, the idea for this webinar uh, is based on uh, questions, letters that we as members of parliament uh, started receiving from our uh, citizens from our voters already since March. Citizens that were concerned, not only necessarily with the practicalities uh, and, uh, and the difficulties that they were facing in their daily lives, uh, Fabian mentioned a few of them, but also concerned with what many of us said today, which is the symbol of Schengen. So maybe my first conclusion today is that and I'm sure that we all agree that Schengen is something that we simply politically cannot afford to lose. I don't think we are there. I don't, I'm not joining the choir of analysts who are already singing the, the, the end of Schengen. I'm not there. But I do think that we have a very high responsibility, all of us in the European Commission, in member states, governments and parliaments, in the European Parliament, we all have a responsibility to do what it takes to make Schengen uh, what it needs to be and what our citizens expect it to be. Um, now, looking very, uh, in very short term, we have the Pact on Migration, which the Commission is due to, to adopt and present to us um, this month, at least that's what we, we hope. And just like the communication that uh, probably was launched uh, half an hour ago, um, I think, or at least I hope that this pact is going to be uh, one that will be uh, equaling the ambition that we all have for a Europe that gives solutions uh, to its citizens and that gives solutions to the problem that it faces. So again, I want to stress this issue of responsibility that we all have first of all towards our citizens because Schengen is about citizens it's not about businesses uh, economy or anything else it is about people 
and the first responsibility is towards them and towards the expectations. The second conclusion that I have is that the state of play, the state of health, as I mentioned in the beginning, is not great, but not because of COVID. There were issues that were predating COVID-19 crisis that had to do either with unfinished legislative business in terms of either migration or border management, or with underdeveloped reflexes of coordination among member states. Um, somewhat borders remain, no matter what we say in the treaty or in legislation, somewhat borders remain a very powerful symbol of statehood. And in moments of crisis or when risks appear, some of these reflexes of statehood are appearing very quickly on the radar of governments and they are taking these decisions, which many of us, those that think a bit more European, don't understand. And I think that we have to internalize uh, a solution to these reflexes if we really want to have a qualitative leap forward in how we manage Schengen. A third conclusion on my side is that. Um, we cannot disentangle borders and migration. I think several of us have said it already, no matter how much I've heard political voices saying that borders is borders and migration is migration, we cannot. So we need an integrated solution that looks both, both at the migration challenges we have, at the need for coordination there, at the need for joint up European solutions there, as well as uh, at the, at the uh, border related uh, solutions. And we also, well, while, while looking at migration, we need to look at the realities of the demographic realities and economic realities and climate related realities around our continent. Um, we are going to have, whether we like it or not, no matter how many instruments we put in place, we are going to have mobility across continents that is driven by, 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 by climate changes, that is driven by, by economic changes, that may be even driven by pandemics, as we have now uh, seen. And we have to integrate into our uh, political thinking all of these uh, realities. And last but not least, and I want to close on this also because this is something that is personally very dear to my heart, we must complete the integration into Schengen of all the member states of Europe. Uh, Sophie Inveld said it as well. We cannot continue to have citizens of the European Union which are treated differently than other citizens. It is not the political message that we want to send to Europeans it is maintaining a, a, an, an atmospheric uh, uh, that we, again, cannot afford to have. Um, with that, again, I'm conscious that I have already uh, gone one minute past, past the mark. Um, I would really like to thank also the interpreters for, for helping us out. Again, thanks to, to all the panelists. Thanks to all those that have uh, taken two hours and a half of their time to watch us. Um, uh, it, it is an important topic. It will remain on our radars and we are going to come back again and discuss again about it, uh, depending on how and uh, uh, along with the evolution um, ahead. So thank you. Uh, have a good rest of uh, the afternoon.